Amen. Sleep is good. Amen. Amen. It feels good to sleep. To sleep in, to sleep well, to sleep deeply. There's just something about sleep. For these human bodies of ours, there is a necessity about it. When we sleep and sleep well, our bodies rest and recharge. So much happens in our bodies while we sleep. In fact, scientists are just now beginning to understand how crucial sleep is to the human condition. It turns out most muscle growth and tissue repair occurs while our bodies sleep. Even more important, we know our immune systems replenish as we sleep. Well-rested bodies, we are told, equal well-rested minds that are confident, healthy, balanced, and strong. It said we spend a third of our lives sleeping. Maybe some of us do a little bit more than that. And it's a good thing because lack of sleep can be dangerous. It leads quicker to death than lack of food. Sleep is the single most important resource for our body next to clean air to breathe. Sleep and rest are so important that God gave us a commandment about it. In fact, I suspect some of you are taking that commandment a little bit too literally. I see some of you prepared to drift off to sleep this morning. But yes, sleep is good. We need it. Sleep too much, though, Jesus says. Sleep at the wrong time, and you might just miss God. Jesus tells us that Noah's, that God's coming is going to be like the flood of Noah. You will carry on in your daily lives, going on in your daily routine, asleep to this world like those living at the time of Noah. And when you aren't paying attention, God is going to come in and sweep it all away. No one knows the day or the hour, but like rains before the great flood, with wrath and power and all, God is going to come. Merry Christmas. Jesus' words this morning are more fear and trembling than comfort and joy. It is more sadness and terror than merry and bright. It's not quite the story we have gathered here this morning to hear on the first Sunday of Advent. We so desperately want to start at the beginning with Mary, with round, joyful, pregnant Mary. Or angels echoing in reply, or the Magi preparing to gather, but instead, we start close to the end. Jesus is on his final journey to Jerusalem. He is approaching his final days before his death, and he knows it. In those days, the Roman occupation of Jerusalem had reached a fever pitch. The air in the ancient city was thick with tensions. Emotions were heightened this time of year because of the Passover. Pilgrims from all around the world were filling the city, and the authorities were nervous as the population, the oppressed population, swelled to capacity. And Jesus, ever more known to those in authority, he too made them a little bit nervous. He appeared to be the leader of a growing movement that threatened those who held the power. So his followers energized, ready to bring this movement right to the thick of it, right to Jerusalem, to the capital, with renewed hope that the Romans would fall, that the status quo would collapse, and that their leader, a new king, would ascend the throne. And so they wait for a game plan. But Jesus does what Jesus does best. He does something really uncomfortable and unexpected. He tells them, run for your lives. Run for the hills. Prepare to escape Jerusalem, because soon all things will come to a head. The Romans will sweep in. They will destroy the city. They will even bring down the great temple. Nation will rise against nation. The sun will lose its shine. The moon its light. Stars will fall. The earth will tremble. All will mourn as the Son of Man comes to earth on clouds of heaven. 
And so they want to know, and who can blame them? The disciples want to know, when is this going to happen? And Jesus says, no one knows. No one knows the day or the hours, not the angels, not me. Only God. So keep awake. Worsening oppression. Deepening divisions, rumors of war, religious strife, crumbling institutions. The world in which Jesus and his followers lived ached for a new kind of existence. They longed for closure, for a new heaven and a new earth, a new creation when the last would be made first, the least made most, the oppressed ready to breathe again. The world in which Jesus and his followers lived longed for a God to bring their pain-filled, disordered, broken world to a close. Apocalyptic imagery, like in our gospel this morning, end-time explanations in the Bible, scholars tell us that they have long been understood as addressed to people who are suffering from oppression. Those big, scary images were to give hope that things are going to change, and change suddenly and dramatically, because God is on their side and hope is on the way. But this is different in this morning's scripture, because Jesus' audience here seems less oppressed than they do tired. For whether they are persecuted or privileged, they have reached the point that they no longer believe anything about this world is going to change. They assume that today and tomorrow will be exactly like yesterday, and after days, months, years of such scaled-back expectations, they are getting tired, hopeless. Nothing will change. I don't know about you, but I feel tired. I don't mean tired physically, but tired emotionally. Absolutely exhausted with the state of our world. Another mass shooting. Another broken peace treaty. More drama from Washington. Dissolving norms. Collapsing order. I have to confess that there are more days than not where I am feeling tired and hopeless. Sleepy. And so I have found it easier, maybe you have too, to just turn it all off. To change the channel away from the evening news. To silence and block all push alerts from my phone and my email. To steer clear from social media anything and everything. To close my eyes to the state of the world. I've gone back to sleep. I've pulled the cover over my head, safe and warm from the ills facing this world. And without the constant alert of breaking news, I have fallen deeper into sleep, and it feels good. But along comes Advent. Advent with its stories of trembling earth and darkening sun. Advent comes along each year, sounding like a clanging gong. An alarm, a trumpet sounding in our ears. One theologian calls it the church wake-up call. Jesus gives those sleepy, hopeless disciples, he gives us an image of what will come that is more than what we can wrap our heads around. Those frightening, bold, beautiful glimpses of God coming into the world and a commandment. Jesus says, I know you're tired. I know you're hopeless but keep awake. Jesus tells them not to sit around and wait as if God alone is going to take care of this world, but to wake up to the world, to stay awake, and to get to work. The Nazis were already on their rise to power when a young Alfred Delp entered seminary. He could see where the Third Reich was headed, and he was troubled, as his journal points out, he was troubled, as many of his fellow Germans he felt were asleep. So once ordained, Delp joined a resistance group, an underground movement, 
that sought to undermine the theology that was supporting the Nazi government. Because of that, and his writing, and his preaching, it landed him in prison, sentenced to death for treason. In the last weeks of Delp's life, kept in a darkened prison cell, he reflected and wrote almost exclusively on the season of Advent and its meaning for us modern Christians. And here's what Delp had to say. There is perhaps nothing we modern people need more than to be genuinely shaken up. Many of the things that are happening today would never have happened if we had been living in that movement and disquiet of heart, which results when we are faced with our God. And when we look clearly at the things as they really are, here's the message of Advent, Delp wrote. Faced with him who is the last, the world will begin to shake. It is time to awaken from sleep. It is time to wake up to begin somewhere. The great question to us is whether we are still capable of being shocked, or whether it is to remain so that we see thousands of things and know that they should not be and must not be, and we get hardened to them. How many things have we become used to in the course of the years, of the weeks and months, so that we stand unshocked, unstirred, inwardly unmoved? Advent is a time of being deeply shaken, so that humanity will one day wake up to themselves. Alfred Delp is right. The season of Advent is about waking up to this world, but more so, and this is hard, it's about keeping awake to this world. Keeping awake in such a way that we see what should not be and must not be. And keeping awake is hard because it often means paying attention to the difficult stuff about our life. To keep awake in this sense is to stare the breaking news, the drama, and the shadows head on. Keeping awake means opening our eyes anew to the children still in cages at the border and crying out that it should not be and must not be. Keeping awake means keeping our eyes open to the rising sea and the changing climate and the collapse of reason and urgency and shouting out that this should not be and must not be. Keeping awake means paying close attention to the plight of Syrians living with daily bullets and bombs or to our own nation's children who learn active shooter drills before their ABCs and praying out loud, this should not be and must not be. The task for those of us who live in these fearful times is to pay attention, to be watchful, to keep doing that which our God has entrusted us with doing, and to keep ourselves from becoming numb. To stay awake, Jesus says. To not let mind-bending violence or heart-wrenching news lull us into a trance so that we fall asleep and are swept away like in the flood. I am coming to do a new thing, our God tells us, but until then, keep awake. Keep at it. And that, good Christian people, that's the entire message of the season of Advent, and I am willing to stake my salvation. That is the entire message of this Christian life. To shake ourselves. To wake up. To not fall asleep in hopelessness, but stay rooted and alert and awake in God's ache for justice. Suspecting his own death to be imminent, Delp wrote these words, If we want to transform our world again, if Advent is truly to come again, then the great question for us is whether we come out of these convulsions with the determination, Yes, arise. It's time to awaken from our sleep. It's time for each of us to go to work. 
So rest up, take your nap, and get your beauty sleep. But wake up. Wake up, God's people, because God is coming, and there is a lot of work us Christians have to do. Thanks be to God. Amen.